Hey everyone, welcome to Santa Barbara Talks with Josh Molina. It's Wednesday, September 4th, and I want to talk to you about a few things today. I've had very, very busy weeks. So I want to talk to you about me covering the big standoff at the Buena Tierra housing development in Old Town Goleta and what that entailed and do a little bit of explanation of journalism. And then I have my top 10 list of highlights, me, Josh highlights from the Santa Barbara County Democratic Central Committee Labor Day barbecue at Tucker's Grove. So that's going to be the second half of this. First, please hit subscribe on YouTube and also visit SantaBarbaraTalks.com and consider making a contribution if you like my content and support my efforts. I greatly appreciate it. I do this all on my own, on my own time. So let's talk a little bit about what happened Saturday morning. Galita, Hollister, and Fairview, there was a standoff. There was a fight that took place on the property, and then the, the suspect locked himself in his room. Okay, so 911, authorities are called, everybody comes out, law enforcement, sheriff's office, and they're trying to get this person out safely, and they're trying to protect everybody else. And so Oddly, like I, uh, one of my one of my deals in my current situation is that I work Saturdays, Saturday mornings, and uh, I'm supposed to cover like breaking news, which is kind of cool, you know, because I've been a reporter for a long, long, long time, and when I started, I was mostly covering breaking news. So that's what most <clears throat> new reporters do is they cover breaking news, crime stories, and they learn a lot of skills by having to react really quickly to what's happening learn how to write fast, write on deadline. Obviously, you got to get stuff up quickly because you're competing with digital media or competing with television. So I don't do as much of it anymore because I do so many other things, but um, I still do it from time to time. And so I was actually dropping off my, uh, my big Honda Odyssey at the dealership in the morning, and then this thing's happening. So I like raced uh up old town you know and, and i don't know how many blocks that is but from Kellogg to to fairview and uh it was actually worked out great because you can't even get parking in that area <laughs> if i tried to park nearby there you already doesn't let anyone park there who doesn't work there and there's really no parking in old town galita um anyway and so i went up there and it's a huge scene right this was pretty uh you know remember when i talk about things it's from a journalistic lens right like i'm not uh, an activist i'm not somebody who has an agenda where i want to like make people look good or make people look bad it's analysis and explaining the situation so from a news story perspective it's like a good story because you've got conflict you've got breaking news you've got impact you've got this former super eight a hotel within the county and others working together to bring people off the streets from unhoused situations into um, permanent supportive housing, which is an amazing deal. We want more of that. And so this place is a, a place of scrutiny. People are looking at it. So people who don't like this project obviously are saying, see, we told you, look at the kind of stuff that can happen there. And other people are saying, this is like an outlier, right? This is like a one-time thing. And so that's what's going on here is there's this big standoff. So apparently this guy, I talked to residents who live there. They were evacuated. They're all standing in the parking lot. They're all standing outside in the perimeter. And I talked to them and they described the situation. And I talked to the guy who said he was beat up. He showed me the, the cuts on um, his head. And uh, he showed me like missing teeth that he had. He says were knocked out. He he told me that he had six teeth knocked out uh, from this fight. And so the individual was in the room and uh, law enforcement is there and they're trying to get him out. He won't come out. I, I was told they shot like, a, like some sort of BB gun through the window uh, to sort of commu facilitate communication. And uh, the, the guy, I saw this, I witnessed this. He took some sort of chair and just sort of uh, bashed out the window and uh, shattered, sent the glass shattering out forward. And so he created this big hole and he kept coming in and out and talking to people, authorities. And he's sort of, you know, trying to shame the law enforcement officers, you know, like take me down, come get me kind of stuff. And um, other people, the residents are like yelling, like, hey, 
come out, you know, stop this, you know, and they're worried about him, some of them. And so it's this huge thing. So as a reporter, you know, you're working. And so you, you have to balance a lot of different things here. Obviously, you need to find out what, what's going on, the official story, okay, what legitimately happened here. And typically, you do that through sourcing it from law enforcement because they are privileged sources and you can attribute accusations of fact to law enforcement. And so all the law enforcement that was there was working, trying to negotiate, trying to talk to this guy. It wasn't like sometimes they have a, a PIO who will show up. There was no PIO. Again, it's Saturday morning. Maybe the PIO is not working at that time. And so there's 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 this happening. So who am I talking to? I'm talking to the residents. I'm getting a sense of what goes on here and uh, how they like living here. I'm obviously asking what I can about the suspect. I'm asking about the victim. I'm talking to the victim. I'm reporting. It's called sort of just gathering string in reporter circles. Is you your job is to not to take sides. Your job's not to do PR for the sheriff's office. Your job is to not try to make anyone look bad or good. Your job is to just explain to the public what is happening in that context. So I was fortunate to be able to talk to some of the residents and the the victim. And, you know, he was a he's a U.S. Army veteran. He was not interested in having anything bad happen to this individual. At least he, he told me, you know, he didn't want to press charges. I think with a big event like that, you know, he doesn't really have a choice. But um, he was just basically saying, I just want to go back into my room. And that's what all the other residents were saying that they wanted to do because they were evacuated and they couldn't get back in because this guy could be dangerous. And so they're trying to negotiate with him. And also they shut off Fairview, like from, from uh, not Fairview. Yeah. Fairview from Hollister to, you know, just like that area right in front of the, the, um, Buena Tierra. Okay. And so a lot of the businesses going to do business, the, the Jiffy Lube workers, their cars are parked in a shared parking space with Buena Tierra. And so they couldn't even get their cars out. So, it's quite the, you know, it's like an adrenaline thing when you're a breaking news reporter. And you know, Santa Barbara always has these breaking news crime stories bigger than you would think for a city of this size. And when I worked in the Bay Area, of course, you get stuff all the time that I had to run out and cover. Um, you know, I've, I've seen way more than, you know, I'm going to share here in terms of uh, death and violence and you know, abuse and all of these things that happen everywhere, but you see more of it in larger populations in bigger cities. And so this was uh, quite a, a tense scene. And one of the things for, you know, any young journalists, I know, you know, students who watch this podcast is get there, get there as quickly as you can to cover this stuff. I got there before law enforcement had actually cordoned off the area with caution tape. So once they cordon off the area with caution tape, you know, you, you can't cross the caution tape. You have to respect what they're saying, assuming that the, the space is reasonable. Sometimes law enforcement will go overboard and block off huge areas unnecessarily. But um, in this case, they blocked off the parking lot, which really annoyed the residents because they were sitting there standing. This is where they live and they can't even be near it. So everybody had to leave and go into this open field, open space. I had got there before there, so I was able to get some fairly decent pictures. But because I wasn't expecting to cover this, because it's breaking news, I didn't have my other camera. I just had my cell phone camera. So I was just shooting pictures of what I could with my cell phone. And cell phones are great at close up. They're not really great far away shooting up, you know, three stories to a balcony. And so anyway, I got my the best shots I could. And, you know, the key is like you got to get there fast, get there quick, and you got to be afraid, not be afraid to challenge authorities to ask questions. You know, once they asked me to leave, they actually wrapped the caution tape around me while I was working. Uh, and I turned around like, oh, I better get out of here, you know. And so I left the area and um, went, you know, watched from where everyone else was. And they eventually uh, uh, got the individual out. Um, they did, there were bean bags, there was tear gas. It was a big deal. They eventually were able to uh, detain him and take him into custody. And things were much better, um, you know, by the end of the day, by midday. But from a reporter's perspective, so what's the difference there? Like, why do we send someone there versus why don't we, why do we just not rely on law enforcement? Because I think too often 
We uh, journalists take press releases as their source for materials. And obviously a press release went out that day, but the press release is one source. The press release is the source of law enforcement and stories have multiple characters. They, they don't just have one power top down perspective of what's happening. There's impact to people, there's residents, there's workers. Everyone who experiences a little bit of that interaction that day has a role in what happened. And so as a journalist, you have, you have to get all of that. It's called color, right? You could develop, out, develop that narrative. Because if you don't, if you just run the press release, and sometimes journalists have to do that. They just can't get there. And that's, that's fine. That's the best we can do sometimes. But the best the story we can do is when we round that out with our own firsthand reporting and that makes a story come to life so i got some pictures of of people individuals i got a little bit of video and uh create a story that lets people feel like wow that was a big deal because what we don't want people to to think is like it's insignificant we don't want them to think it's like the hugest thing that ever happened in galita either we have to put it into context and that's what firsthand reporting is there is no substitute in reporting for being there just got to be there. You cannot fake it. You cannot talk to people later. You can't, um, you know, use courtesy photos from the sheriff's office. I mean, you can, but it's if, if, if you have the resources and the option to actually go cover it, that is always the preferred choice. And why do we do that? Not for us as journalists, for our readers, for the public. You know, there's so much that goes on on like next door, which is just, I mean, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna get started on next door, but uh, there's a lot of rumors. There's a lot of just stuff people say, and um, that's not reporting. That's not journalism. So journalism helps clarify things and bring accuracy to perspectives by by being firsthand. And by the way, if I cover this, it's not media bias. Like it's not like me not liking Buena Tierra. Um, it, it's just. This is what we do. Like you cover the things that happen in your community, regardless of what is happening and with, you know, where it is. And if it's breaking news and this is a, a potentially dangerous situation, then the journalists should cover it, you know? And so I think people need to develop their media literacy there. And there's lots of people who are sending me stuff or posting on social media that they're not surprised that something like this would happen. This kind of stuff can happen anywhere, and I'm not shilling for Buena Tierra. I'm sure they're going to have to make some changes and figure out stuff to improve there. But um, you can have these kind of situations anywhere, and we do have examples of that. So, so yeah, like, does it make Buena Tierra look bad for a little while? Yeah, they're going to have to address it from a PR perspective. But those people who say we should not be taking people from the streets and putting them in permanent supportive housing because of a situation like this, it's a little bit of an extreme reaction because, um, you know, if it's happening every day, if there's chaos, if it's like clearly after a year, absolutely unworkable, that's a different thing. But we don't just let one thing ruin it for all those other residents. And I talked to those residents, they, they all have individual stories and they like living there. They say they keep to themselves, you know, no, no place is perfect where you have people living, but, um, you know, they were really concerned that somehow this would like affect the program. And, um, I don't think that's going to happen, but you know, you, there's no substitute for actually talking to people, uh, face to face. A lot of the hostility, misunderstanding, it goes away when you actually look people in the eye and talking to these residents, you know, they like living there and they they know a lot about what happens there. They're the best people to talk to. So just for me, this that was a crazy uh, day for me, crazy morning, because I wasn't expecting to do that, to run there. I had this thing in the afternoon. I had to be at it like like 12, 15. So like ruined, oh, I mean, pushed everything back. And it was just like this chaos. But, you know, journalists have a sickness. I mean, I say like, I, I mean, that is a compliment. Like the good journalist, you have a sickness. You don't you don't check out at five o'clock. You don't turn off your phone on the weekends. You uh, you work twenty four seven. You love it constantly, and you we do it often for little pay. Even the people in the big markets are underpaid for what they are worth, and we do it because it's like this adrenaline thing. Like we want to inform the public. We want to educate them and bring. Um, 
information so they can make better choices about their lives. They can be better informed, better empowered, whether it's a breaking news story or business story or politics story or school, school story, education story. The same principles are all there. And so um, I love it. It's that adrenaline. It reminds me why we do this sort of thing. And you kind of have to love it to do it well, because when you're, when you're out there, <laughs> You know, it's hot. I still have a little bit of a, a sunburn from, from doing it. And, and, you know, I'm not even, you know, it's like the first responder, the law enforcement, you know, they're like in the super intense situation. So a journalist job is to explain all of that. And yeah, you know, so any young reporters go there, get there. If you overreact and you get there and it's not a big deal. Okay. That happens sometimes, but more often than not, when you get there, it's worth it. And it's a really cool story and opportunity to be able to share that with with readers, because if we don't share it, then no one knows. And then that just diminishes the impact of all that happened. OK, so uh, you can check out that story in Newshawk.com. I posted some photos on my Instagram, Motown, Josh. Um, some of my students know what, what Motown, <laughs> the origin of that Instagram. <laughs> But I am uh, at Motown Josh, and yeah, so you can check out that story, and uh, you never know what your day is going to be like as a journalist. You wake up, you think you're doing one thing, and all of a sudden you're doing something else, and that's exactly why why we do it. Okay, so I want to shift gears. <laughs> one more topic. Monday, I covered the Santa Barbara County Democratic Central Committee, Democratic Party annual Labor Day barbecue. So one of the things that I've been trying to do in the last year is um, elevate my photo skills, uh, take better photos, get better angles, really try to highlight people in the community doing things that are important. And a lot of the stuff I cover is politics. So a lot of the stuff that I shoot is, um, you know, seemingly kind of like boring situations, right? It's not the staged events. It's not environmental portraits. It's not travel stuff. You know, it's basically people, large gatherings. And so I've been trying to get like super tight shots of people showing emotion, faces, smiling, all of that. And, uh, yeah, I'm having a blast. You know, I get, uh, you know, I get good feedback on it. So that makes me feel good as well. But uh, the Labor Day event is a cool event because there's so many people there. And it's an opportunity to shoot photos. It's opportunity to source, like network, talk to people, um, all these people in one place at one time. And so I always look forward to covering this event because it's sort of a who's who of the Democratic Party, both in terms of electeds as well as candidates and activists. And um, it's just a, a fun um, event, you know. And so uh, I'm going to give you my top 10 <laughs> Uh, highlights, uh, my top 10 Josh Molina highlights of the Labor Day barbecue at Tucker's Grove. And before anyone gets too stressed out, it's mostly positive okay, just gonna say that right away. Okay. I just want to say like number 10, there were a lot of people there. Like I sometimes overestimate in my crowd estimates, but I did ask Darcel Elliott what the chair, what she thought or how many people would like 250 or something, maybe close to 300 people who showed up. Now I go to this event every year. And so it's, um, it's usually well attended, but this year felt, I mean, there was much more people than usual. It's obviously a presidential year. There's a lot of people running for various uh, offices and the cities, the school boards, County Office of Education, North County, San Barbara City College, like there's so much there. So uh, there are a lot of people there. So I was just impressed with the, the, the amount of energy and the large crowd that was there. The Democratic Party is definitely energized by Kamala Harris and her presidential campaign. So that's a lot of enthusiasm that it is that is that is coming to the event. And so uh so it's yeah, huge crowd, lots of energy. Number 10, that was the first thing that I was struck by was there are a lot of people here and there was a long line for the food, of which I'll get to in a second. Okay. Number nine, Labor Day picnic barbecue highlights for Josh. Salute Carbajal, Monique Limon, and Greg Hart. So this is, these are our highest ranking lawmakers in the region. Assembly member Hart, State Senator Monique Limon, and obviously Representative Congressman Salute Carbajal. They were all there. And wow, it is, uh, so 
So obviously, <laughs> I don't agree with with anybody 100% of the time. And obviously, elected officials do stuff all the time that is upsetting, annoying. They stay safe. They're, they don't um, necessarily put, put themselves out there if it's not good for them politically, you know. And so I get all that, right? I, I, there's no politician who I'm like, yeah, number one, with you all the time. Um, but I got to say, Slew Carbajal, Manuka Mungre, like we're so lucky to be able to have these three as our representatives because they they do so much work. They work so hard. They're so good at constituent service, and they represent Democrats really well. They represent Republicans. They represent everybody. And, of course, some people will never like them. But if you ever get to know them, as, you know, I get to know them as a journalist, so that's a certain kind of relationship. But I'm sure just as, like, regular people, constituents, like, they, they're responsive, and they try to help out. And uh, to see the three of them together, just like being their little clique, their little uh, you know, group together, it's so cool. It's like, wow, this these people are so impressive, and they're so nice, and they're so kind, and they're doing so much in their own eyes to help this region. And they are in safe districts, right? I know um, Tom Cole, he's challenging Salud Carbajal. Um, you know, there's things I like about Tom Cole, but... Uh, this is a Democratic district, and Salud is well-liked, and Salud has crossover appeal among some moderates and conservatives. And so it's like an almost an impossible situation to unseat him, um, you know, and, and there's a reason for that, because, you know, Salud's really kind, and he does constituent services. And, of course, there's plenty of national issues that I disagree with him on, one really big in particular, which I'm not going to get into here, but you can probably imagine, but that's not the point, right? He's got to balance all of these these needs, and he's doing his best. And uh, he's a Mexican American representative, you know, of his district, and that's just so cool to see that. As is Monique Lamone and Greg Hart is like a legend in this town, just so good. City Council, Board of Supervisors, and like every, he's one of these people. Every time I talk to, I just like marvel at his like intellect he's so smart and uh if it's five seconds five minutes or an hour it's always a really i'm always learning something from him so seeing those three together it's like wow this is the democratic party the the strength the engine that makes it run okay so number eight <laughs> mayor paula parodi Galita mayor she read a poem so we have all these speakers and i'm going to get to some of these some of them in a second and she goes up there and reads a poem uh, about her candidacy. So we have people who are like all fired up, trying to rally organizers, rally the troops, talk about the national issues, school boards, education, and Paula in the most Galita, good land way. And I am a Galita resident. I love Galita. I was born in Galita, grew up in Galita. Well, I grew up in we rented, so we moved around all the time. But um, I, we kind of like settled more so in Galita in um junior high and high school right and so um most of high school anyway so um i love galita i consider it you know one of the places i grew up in and uh of course she read the most amazing poem and i'm going to put it up here on the screen i'm not going to read the whole thing so they all had a minute and, and she pretty much stuck to a minute others didn't which is fine but you know she says i fought for kid safety with the pta then Community Action Commission was my work day. Now in my second Galita mayor's term, your support for re-election, I hope to earn. Democratic values are what I stood for. I'm endorsed by the Dems, the Enviros, and more. I hope you all will lend a big hand to make Galita an even greater good land. <laughs> if that's not a Galita poem, I don't know what is. But uh, Mayor Brody, that's, that's awesome, right? It's good that you can go up there and just not just, just you know, bring yourself to the moment. And uh, it's cool. It's art. It's fun. I enjoyed it. And uh, Kyle Richards, right after, said, I think I need a new speech writer. Uh, people really liked it. I heard a lot of applause, a lot of laughing. So so good job, uh, Mayor Brody. Of course, she's running against Rich Foster and Galita. And uh, so, yeah, there's uh, kind of a uprising of people trying to unseat some incumbents in there okay so number seven all right let's go to city councilor oscar gutierrez running for re-election against tony becerra so 
the way it worked is that so number seven is Oscar. I don't know. I don't want to say insulted Tony, but Oscar calls out Tony. Okay. So, so everybody gets a minute. They're talking about that in campaigns. And Oscar Gutierrez goes up there, talks about the app he created, talked about remote public comment, talk about uh, advocating to keep schools open on the weekends and after hours so people can play, which is a great thing because I did that all the time. These schools are great places for people to get recreation that are don't cost anything. And during COVID, they started to close and then they stayed closed. And so anyway, that's a great thing that he did. But he took a little jab at his opponent, Tony Rosero, which stood out to me because we had just hosted this forum and um, that didn't come out at that point when he was sitting right next to him. So I just thought it was kind of interesting. He said, I'm running against a registered Republican who may or may not live in the district. So I just thought that was kind of an interesting little uh, poke jab at Tony. Um, Oscar is like a very likable guy, and I think betting money says he's going to get reelected. But then again, you never know. And I'm not saying I want Oscar to get reelected. I'm not saying anything bad about Tony. I am just saying that conventional wisdom suggests that he's probably has the upper hand there in getting reelected. But I just thought that was interesting because he's so uh, affable. He took a little jab, right? So stands out to me. Okay, number six. Eric Friedman got to talk about the Santa Barbara sales tax. And this is like real political insider, but Eric Friedman speaking at the Dem party, he is a Democrat, right? He's He worked for Salud Car Carbajal, but he isn't exactly like the flag waving bearer of the Democratic party at all. Um, but he's a Democrat, he gets endorsed by them. And it was so cool to see that they gave him an opportunity to to talk about the sales tax and gave him a platform to speak. And um, Eric Friedman, we don't know what his next move is. If he's gonna run for first district, technically he could run for mayor. He's got a couple more years on his term. So he's got some different directions he can go. Um, so it's, it was just interesting. I was not expecting him to get speaking time on a day where there were so many candidates. So yeah, great to see Eric Friedman there. All right. Um, number five. Okay. Laura Capps and Doss Williams standing shoulder to shoulder, speaking together, talking about these county issues. And this is... Uh, Cool. It's interesting to see if for a lot of different reasons. We obviously know that Laura Capps challenged Doss Williams for supervisor, and she came close, and I don't know, 1,500 votes or something like that, and she almost unseated him. And this was a very tense campaign, and it was tense because Doss, I mean, Whenever you have a Democrat challenging another Democrat and you got super popular Democrats challenging each other, it forces people to choose. And inevitably, when you choose, you're going to make somebody unhappy. And so people are having to choose between Laura and Doss. And Laura ran a very strong campaign on the cannabis issue. And so she really laid a blueprint, the groundwork for somebody to criticize Doss Williams for her campaign or going forward. And she didn't win, but Doss Williams worked so hard to keep his seat and he got reelected. And they've obviously since made up politically They because Laura was then able to, to move and run in the second district and get uh, appointed. I don't think anyone ran against her. And so they've had to work together. And it's, it's just kind of cool considering the intensity of their campaign. And they've been, you know, they sit next to each other sometimes, I mean, they sit on the same board on the board of supervisors, and they obviously work together on a lot of different issues, whether it's uh, rent evictions in Isla Vista or housing situations, they work together. But it was for me, it was just so interesting to see them side by side at the Dem party talking. Doss goes first, Laura goes second. And uh, just like stuff you just would not imagine a few years ago. And here it is. And, you know, Doss, of course, is sort of, I'm obviously he's always going to be involved with the Democratic Party. And I imagine he'll run for something down the road again and win probably. And, uh, you know, I have conflicting views on him in terms of his political service. But, uh, this is kind of his last 
Labor Day barbecue with him in office. And he is a legend, right? He's like the, you know, his, he's been doing this since 2005, I guess it is when he was elected to the city council at 29 years old. And so he's the longest serving elected official in Santa Barbara. Like he's been elected to office consecutively since 2005, either as a city council member, a member of the state legislature as assembly or the county board of supervisors. And, you know, Greg Hart took a, took a break there in the middle. So he, you know, it's just kind of interesting. Is, is it a, sort of a changing of the guard or it's sort of like the end of this era with him there. And it was just interesting to watch him sort of give his final Labor Day speech as an elected official. And I'm sure he's going to get a bunch of uh, flowers, as Miley Cyrus would say, in the next three months as he uh, leaves office. People are going to be wanting to give him that credit, respect, and all of that for his years of service, which was just like, wow, you know, these two standing side by side and Laura did not win the battle, but the anti-DOS people won the war and here they are together. I thought was really intriguing and interesting. Okay. Number four, Jonathan Abood's try to. <laughs> so this Jonathan Abood, apparently he's like a great cook, great chef. He's got an Instagram page where he shows all his food and wow like he looks like the best tri-tip barbecuer on the planet uh from what he posts so he cooked a whole bunch of tri-tips for this event and it looked amazing now me as a journalist i, I don't really like to eat at the events because i don't know it's just like a old school kind of thing like you don't cover something and then eat because then it, it sort of creates the impression that you have some loyalty or you owe them something and it's kind of dumb you got to kind of keep it under five or ten dollars if you're going to do that i'm not going to be counting like how many slices of tri-tip this is worth so so i was like no it's cool darcel i'm not going to eat you know it's fine but when it was all over i was like went to go back and like see is there any more tri-tip <laughs> that way i'm not taking it away from anybody and it was all gone but this guy cooked the most amazing tri-tip i've heard from people and uh, tastes delicious he loves it his enthusiasm for cooking for barbecuing for making tri-tip is off the chart I, it might be greater than his love for public service and that's a high bar um, so i took some photos of him and he promised me he owes me some tri-tip down the road um He's cooking September 15th or something like that. No big deal if I don't get it. But I never got a chance to taste it. But I heard from everybody else that it was it was great. And it's so cool to see them cooking their own food and, and catering to their own uh, catering their own food. It's pretty impressive. Okay. Speaking of impressive, number three, Darcel Elliott, chair of the Santa Barbara County Democratic Party. Darcel and I have known each other a long time. Um, I've used, she used to be my boss for a time being when we both worked for Doss Williams in the state legislature. And, um, you know, she's like the, the working, she works really hard to keep the party together, to hold these events. And obviously there's a lot of things you can criticize about the party, but when we're just looking at the fact that she puts this event on every year. She organizes, she rallies the troops, she's the inspiration behind the canvassing, she gets new organizers, and this is a significant deal. It's a volunteer position. People really love Darcel. Um, she's, of course, chief of staff to Doss Williams, so she's got, like, that whole thing, and she works hard, she tells me, to separate the two, and uh, I believe her in that regard, and so... It's just cool to watch her. She kicks it off. She leads it off. She's the first talker. She uh, gets everyone together to be able to talk about all of these issues. And she's the one who's been the chair of the party for a long time. And she's going to continue to be the chair even when Doss Williams leaves office. So what does that mean? We don't know. But I think that on this Labor Day event, what struck out to me was these people really care about their cause, about their purpose, about reaching people, about canvassing. And even if you're somebody watching this podcast and you don't like Democrats, you don't like any of the names I've mentioned, you don't like Darcel Elliott, you have to be able to respect that 
she works really hard. She tries really hard and she does a good job. I mean, this is still a democratic elected. This is, we still have mostly Democrats in office. And so she is effective to some degree and watching her kind of do this year after year, I think it's pretty cool. And, it, and it's impressive. So that's number three, number two. All right. Wendy Santa Maria is a great talker. She went up there. Wow. I mean, she is firing up the crowd. She grabs the microphone and the first thing she says is, let's not forget that immigrants built this country, right? She is preaching. She is talking at the crowd and she is letting them know how the world should be from her perspective, speaking on behalf of the people that she wants to represent, that she does represent already in her activism role and her work roles. And she stands out like there's no way you can look at this candidate and hear her talk and not think this potentially is a person with a political future if she can get elected to the city council. And if she does it, maybe right down the road, something like uh, the legislature is a better office for her uh, on that big stage where she can talk about these national issues uh, because um there's no doubt like she has a microphone and she talks you hear her you hear her message and so people who don't like her message are going to be outraged by her people who like her message are going to be inspired by it so i think it's part of just this newer generation of people who are just trying to take the reins right and try to try to lead in santa barbara Will she get elected? I don't know. It's not for me to say. And I'm not saying that she should get elected. I'm not advocating for one side or not. Of course, she's taking on incumbent Alejandro Gutierrez. So I'm not like trying to say she deserves to be on the city council. That's for the voters of District 1 to decide. What I am saying is, oh, she's an impressive speaker and she knows how to command attention. And I, I just wonder down the road with all these puzzle pieces, these chess pieces of like, Who's running for future offices? You know, da with Doss Williams out, it sort of creates a opening, really, for somebody to run for something if he doesn't want to run again. And so who's going to fill that slot? There are other current electeds who have eyes at a uh, higher office once, you know, Salud decides to retire and whatever Monique Lamone's going to do and Greg Hart's going to do and all of that. So I wonder if there's already sort of early talk about what's the future of Wendy Santa Maria if she gets elected to the city council seat because she is uh she can uh talk really well and uh, she speaks to her constituents in a very strong manner and uh you can check out my Instagram I posted some video as well number one number one highlight of the democratic barbecue David Silva are you kidding me like who is this guy the vice mayor of Buellton, he's running for the mayor of mayorship of Buellton. David Silva, holy cow, this guy gave this speech. He was so uh, engaging. He was so, he connected with the audience. He was simultaneously humble, but also confident. He was inclusive and he was funny. And it's like, this guy, this guy from Buellton looks like a rising star in the Democratic Party. And so to me, he stole the show of the event. He was somebody who uh, we're going to probably have to keep an eye on. Now, I don't cover the North County politics, so I don't know like if he's a front runner or not. Uh, I, I don't know. But my sense is that Buellton being a place where a lot of people choose to buy homes because there's more housing in that area uh, and then like maybe commute to work in Goleta or Santa Barbara, that there's probably a growing constituent base of uh, people who are less conservative than historically Buellton has been. And uh, David Silva just kind of said that, you know, you don't think of Buellton as being this bastion of liberal values, but you know, it is becoming more so. And so, so David is pretty impressive. He gave a great speech and 
to me was like the the highlight of the barbecue in terms of all of the speakers and so uh a star is, I mean, it's to me, right? I just noticed him, but other people obviously have noticed him before he got elected two years ago. So, so he knows people know who he is, but for me, a star was born on that day for me, because he looks like somebody who's, who could go a long way on a lot of these issues because he just came across this, given that rare quality, you know, like um, there, there are elected officials who are smart, they're elected officials who are super engaging when you put them together you have kind of an x factor and he has sort of that x factor so it's gonna be interesting to watch that race i'm actually gonna have him on my show i'm gonna have him on my podcast and we're gonna talk about all of this and uh get to know a little bit more about him and his background and so see so yeah, to me that was like you know labor day barbecue is a day where i remember that david silva spoke and really fired up the crowd and made an impact so now you know the dems are they kicked off their campaign they kicked off their event and they're gonna go try to get their candidates reelected and other people into office and that's what they'll be doing they'll be walking on saturdays phone banking they'll be walking on some sundays too they'll be doing all this stuff i do want to say uh i guess the republicans held an event as well at Tucker's Grove, a Labor Day event. I heard about this afterward. And so I didn't cover that. Obviously, I would have covered that if I'd known that. Uh, I don't usually associate Republicans with having uh, Labor Day events. So uh, if there's any Republicans watching this, like it isn't like I decided not to cover your event, to cover the damn event. Um, I would have covered both if I knew they were both there. Um, I didn't really see a big crowd. I know the parking lot was really packed. Maybe that's why, but there were also a lot of other people. So, um, so yeah, I don't know. But uh, as a journalist, we we cover everything. We, 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 we're supposed to cover everything. We're not here to pick and choose. But if you don't tell us what you're doing, we can't cover anything. So uh, let us know. Let us know, you know if you're going to be having your own counter picnic at Tucker's Grove, the same place that Dems have been having it for the last few years, you know, but uh, uh, anyway, so that's why there's no coverage of that. But uh, once again, great Labor Day event. And I uh, just wanted to share my thoughts. Thanks a lot for your time. I greatly appreciate uh, all your support, uh, subscribing, any contributions to the podcast. Thank you so much. And uh, yeah, I'll talk to you soon. Have a great day.